Armando Reveron, the Venezuelan painter who went mad beside the sea, remains a mystery today, even as in the beginning, despite everything that has been written about him. What lingers in the public mind is the strange adventure of his return to nature. If thereby the skies of his landscapes gained extraordinary luminosity, devotion of his life to the sun led him to death and utter solitude, a prey to malnutrition and dementia. Born in 1889, Reveron received good academic training. However, the well-bred young impressionist of 1914 found himself irresistibly attracted by the spell of tropical nature. Turning his back upon the past, casting overboard all the refinements of Western civilization, he plunged into a fierce and unequal struggle against a demonic force, acquiescing at last in total identification with his surroundings. Laymen and connoisseur alike are struck by the unity of Reveron's creative endeavor. Since the colonial carver of saints, no Latin American artist has arrived at a more complete fusion of work and existence. Reveron makes no distinction between life and art. Contrary to the practice today, he allows for no separation between attitude and achievement. His life does not culminate in his work. The two are fused as in a crucible, each annihilating itself in the other. Here is a second key to his existence, opening the door to another world in whose depths gleam the knowing smiles of these two cloth mannequins. Mingling the Spanish past with Aboriginal tradition, Reveron conjures up in a setting redolent of superstition the familiar spirits of Indian magic. With splendid illogic, Reveron used only the limited means readily at hand in creating his paintings. Ground earths constituted his colors. They were mixed on palettes of leather. He made his own brushes, wrapping the handles in rags, in his words, so as not to feel the hardness of the wood between his fingers. Often, his paintings were done on burlap, with little in the way of sizing. on the beach near Makuto, where fishermen are his friends and helpers. In a sort of castle he built for himself. From 1921 on, Reveron lived in isolation on a then deserted stretch of coast near Caracas known as Makuto. There he began to build himself a small rustic castle of stone, furnished with the barest of essentials for living and painting. Two monkeys, Pancho and Pepe, are his constant companions. His studio and living quarters are unique. Construction of the castle began with a bizarre workshop in which Reveron surrounded himself with strange beings, the inventions of his imagination created by his own hand. For company, he had only his faithful Juanita, Pancho the monkey, and a few domestic fowl gathered about his water tank. He gets ready to paint. Reveron viewed painting as an organic activity involving the whole body. Flapping his arms to warm them, he performed a rite. 
The lower body was ignoble, inhabited by demons. It must therefore be kept in subjection, separated from the torso and head, from which spring beauty and order. To this end, he girded himself with a liana, tightened to the point of strangulation, in order to facilitate the trance of inspiration. No one else uses brushes like these. The palette should never come in contact with the flesh. The strange movements of the painter constituted a complicated ritual performed before the easel in order to conjure up images. Reveron attacked the canvas like a fighting bull. Strokes were made using both hands with incredible rapidity. danced back and forth before his easel in a sort of rapture, evaluating the effect he had achieved. The picture took form much as a child develops in the womb. Once he has finished painting, he can relax. Was this but the pose of an actor touched by superstition? Or was it consciousness of the magic spell of the earth? Pepe makes it clear that the show is over. In Caracas, he carries his canvases himself. He has reached his goal. If Reveron clung to a personal conception of reality, bound up with his earliest childhood, if he renounced the culture of the establishment, separating himself from it by an abyss, it was not out of pride or scorn for his fellows. Neither was his the calculated withdrawal of a hermit who believes himself divinely inspired. No, he abandoned the world in search of self-realization in order fully to achieve his destiny. Once he had found himself, Reveron began to build bridges to his fellow men, connecting his world with the one surrounding it. His aim was not to depict existence, but to capture what cannot be grasped. Movement, changeability, the spirit of matter rather than its substance. Reveron does not reproduce. He inverts, transforms, and invents. Invention replaces reality. The wildly extravagant becomes commonplace. From 1921, when he began to build a castle and a world of his own, up until his death in 1954, Reveron led an intensely creative existence. He turned out paintings by the dozen, exhausting every theme which fancy suggested to him. Thus he arrived at what is known as his white period. Obsessed by the intensity of light, he created compositions in which white is superimposed on white in subtle variations of tonality. The aim was not to depict external aspects of nature, but to synthesize atmospheric movement and light.
Treveron's workshop does more than suggest the presence of the artist. It opens the door to the mystery of his painting. Entering it is like descending into another world, a realm ruled by an unknown power where the borderline between reality and fiction has been effaced in Reveron striving to create a mythology entirely his own. Acquaintance with his life and the objects that surrounded him can lead us to an understanding of his actions and the reason for his painting. These objects excite not so much compassion as admiration. They escape common feeling. They bear the touch of a genius. They are the magical components that constitute the center of a deeply felt experience. Careful examination of this little universe helps make clear the overall significance of that experience. Reveron lived an inner drama, as indeed do all artists of talent. When studied in depth, the objects to be found in the workshop, including wigs and false music notebooks, can lead us more surely than do even his best paintings to the discovery in Reveron of a Buddhist steeped in ancient tradition rather than the tireless madman and researcher into light that has been invented for the benefit of tourists. Forgetting myth, we must begin to see in Reveron a man of flesh and blood whose search for lucidity led to ultimate self-renunciation for the sake of his work. The essence of every great artist is his gift for communication. This gift, whether diabolic or divine, Reveron concealed beneath the surface of trickery, by sleight of hand as it were. It begins with jugglery, it ends as witchery. It makes of a mere mortal a magician, or the chief of a tribe of phantoms. Models flit about in a fairy tale room. The feminine faces form masks for actresses who have lost all hope. They are neurotic apparitions subject to continual change in character, in permanent metamorphosis. Reveron was not so much a madman of genius as a great actor, an actor who could not, however, escape the reactions of his own consciousness. Reveron the magician is especially interesting when he explores with terrifying pictorial lucidity the tonalities of a burning midday sky spread over the sea. When he transforms his landscapes into backdrops in false perspective, for a puppet show of suddenly animated winking marionettes. Or when he chooses to celebrate amid his friendly phantoms, holding as it were a royal ball in a plagued besieged castle, a ball at which the guests fall one by one from exhaustion, their smiles fixed in rigor mortis.
Amid the hothouse atmosphere of a carnival orgy in a forgotten castle, a posturing circus world springs to life. There are characters who cannot resign themselves to missing the coach that will take them to their last ball. There are dried up ballerinas, naked and silent, aroused by the beat of a drum to prepare for a joyous night of lust. It is a backstage environment in which sparks fly, casual coupling goes on on the wings, and the director weeps at momentary failure. What gives deep meaning to Reveron's life, work, and objects is the fact that in an age that had lost all belief in the power of magic, he rediscovered the spell cast by art, transforming a blank canvas into an altar upon which he celebrated the rites of witchcraft. Thank you. 